Good evening all. It is good to see you tonight and I am so very thankful for the opportunity to be able to share with you tonight as we do spend some time studying from God's Word. As one of the elders from Conyers, we send our greetings and I'm certainly very thankful to the eldership here for having me here to be a part of this summer series this year. We will be spending time looking at a few uh, different texts and so um, if you have, uh, if you want to put your fingers in various places, we'll be looking there in the book of Psalms. We'll also be considering some things we're going to find in Isaiah 33. And then we're going to end up in the book of Philippians before we're all done tonight, looking at these things as we consider together all that we find within the pages of God's Word to help us to be encouraged tonight as we look at these things together. Now, we're going to begin uh, looking at, and I want to read from, um, our text tonight, which comes from Psalm, uh, let me get over here, Psalm 34. I have a new Bible, by the way, so uh, I'll ask you to be a little patient with me as I'm trying to get these pages all unstuck and get them, uh, get them working the way that they're supposed to and get them broke in very well. But Psalm 34, verse 8, and it begins with this phrase, and, and many, most versions say it this way, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then the, the anchor part of that verse, we find the very next thing. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Now when we look at Psalms, different ones of them, generally speaking, uh, we want to know what kind of Psalm it is. And here's something that's kind of interesting. You know, many study Bibles will have at the top things like uh, what kind of psalm this particular psalm is. It's a, it's a psalm of happiness of those who trust in God. Now, I know it's the middle of the week, and I want to tell you that I appreciate your effort being here, by the way, because of all the things you could have done and all the places you could have been, you decided to come and be here tonight. So as we think on this anchor part of this verse, I want to encourage you uh, to work with me tonight. And this is something that I do at home. I remind people that every time we draw together in Bible study, we want everybody in this room tonight to get one step closer to God. Just one step closer to God. Now some steps are going to be big ones. Some will be, no, eh, not so much. But the idea is for each and every one of us to draw one step closer to our God while we're thinking about this anchor phrase in this verse as we're looking at these things. Now, uh, here's something that's kind of interesting and it really struck me about this particular psalm as we, we, we look at this thing together. Now, down, up at the top of this thing, many study Bibles will say that this is a psalm of David. Now, watch this. It will say when he pretended madness in front of Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. Anybody have that in there on the top of there? Yeah. Now, that struck me as a little odd. And I'll tell you the reason why. One of the things is in Conyers is, is that we've been encouraging people now. This is the 35th year in a row that we've encouraged people to read their Bibles through in a chronological study Bible, you know, all throughout the year. So everybody has, has read through the Bible. And what, what I will do, for instance, this year, I'm preaching through in the chronological way that we're reading. I'll pull text from those things and read. So I'm working on my second lap, by the way. Now, I tell you that to encourage you to stop and think about what you're doing with your time because we're going to talk about it in a minute about some of the things that we know a lot about and we're going to ask ourselves some things. So I want to, I want to kind of lay a little challenge out here to think about what you're doing with your time and what, what I'm doing with my time. And I decided this year that I was going to do some things intentionally I was going to spend even more time as a preacher in, in God's Word, looking through, reading through, and studying through these things. And, and in my second lap through, just a couple of days ago, I read about David's event. And when, when David got in this situation, and he acted as if he was not in his right mind. Now here's an interesting thing. David had gone to Gath, and he was actually appearing before a king, and his name was Achish. 
A-C-H-I-S, or A-C-H-I-S-H, I think is how it's, how it's spelled. And it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And I, I read through that a little earlier this week. Now, that's an interesting thing. So why would the study Bible say that he acted like he had lost his mind in front of Abimelech when 1 Samuel 21 plainly tells us that it was Gath and it was Achish? Well, I did a little research into this, and here's what I found, that this term Abimelech, which is in more than one of my study Bibles, by the way, it's a term that is sometimes used towards someone who is a king. So it's more than a name. It was also reused to reference a king. Now, the reason why I point that out to you is this, that as you and I become better stewards of our time, and meaning by that, not only are we spending time in God's Word, but we're sharing and teaching other folks, one of the things that will come across is someone will say, oh, you see that? That contradicts. And it's right there in your book. So you need to know things like that. And if we're looking at this psalm tonight, there's a, there's a takeaway for you so that you can understand a little bit about what that's about. Now, here's something interesting about this psalm. Looking at Psalm 34, David praises God and he exhorts other people to do the same. He's exhorting God and he, he wants everybody else to do the same. And, and here's the reason why. Because of what we have in verse 8, it's a great place to take refuge and a great place to hide, a great place to relax when we know that we are in the sheltering wing of the Lord. It's a great place to seek refuge with our Lord. You know, we live in a crazy world, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. We, we, we live in a crazy world. Traffic is crazy. You know, traffic is one of the things that really gets, uh, gets me uh, uh, bothered. And the reason why is, is that um, in, in one of the things that I have done over the years, I uh, worked with some people and I ended up with a commercial driver's license and I learned how to drive large equipment on the road and, and spent some time doing that. And if you do, I appreciate what you do, especially when I watch what other people do on the road. And the reason why I say that, too, is you can imagine. It just seems like that um, people drive without any regard too many times of those who are around about them. Now, what's causing that, I do believe, with all that I am, and I didn't hear this, or I didn't come up with this originally. This I heard from uh, another preacher who said that, the more selfish our society gets, the more difficult people are when they drive. Makes sense to me. Does make sense to me. So something to think about here while we're looking at these things is, is that we can take refuge. And sometimes when I'm driving and people are doing crazy things and I do drive a mile or two, and, and when, they're, when they're driving, you know, we want to take refuge. Have you ever felt like that? You need someone I just want to get out of this car or out of this truck and I just want to stop and get away from folks because of the way things are going on. And David says, blessed is the man who takes refuge in the Lord. So with, with that in mind, I want to point you to something else too. When we get down here is um, looking at these things. Let's go over, keep your finger right there. If you've got a ribbon, you know, put that right there. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 33, and um, I want to look at a few of those verses there, Isaiah chapter 33, and we're going to take a look at verses 2 through 6. Isaiah makes a request of the Lord to begin with here. In verse 2, he says, O Lord, be gracious unto us. Be gracious unto us. You ever thought about asking God just to be gracious to you? Just to be gracious? And, and I wonder sometimes if we are so busy and there's folks that you know, that I know, that are even busier tonight than we could possibly imagine that maybe have just gotten a little too busy to remember to ask God to be gracious. As a matter of fact, they probably know a lot about a lot of other things, more so than they know about God and what they could ask of Him and what, what they could do. They, they know a lot of things. You know, in my lifetime, <clears throat> I know 
probably too much about Mayberry. Did I just date myself? I wasn't there when they filmed it to begin with, okay? I wasn't, I wasn't alive. I've always seen it in reruns, but I probably know too much about Mayberry. And back in the days when those of you who recognize what I'm talking about will know, back in the days when automobiles used points and condensers and had regular distributors and used carburetors and things of that nature. I learned quite a bit about cars in those days. Used to, used to work on cars, used to fancy myself about that sort of thing, and I enjoyed that. As a matter of fact, there's a, if, I'm going, if I'm going to kill a little time, I, would, I will watch a channel on TV where they rebuild a car, they'll take a car that's a whole, a whole year's project and they'll do it in 30 minutes. That's kind of neat to watch, you know? Now, what do you know a lot about? That's my, that's my question for tonight. What do you know a lot about? And what have you spent your time getting to know a lot about? My son works right here in Atlanta. He works for 92.9 The Game. He loves sports and he does the sports radio. That's his thing. Caleb Johnson is his name. And Caleb knows a whole lot about sports. He really does. But the challenge that you and I have is not about knowing about sports or cars or Mayberry, but how much do we actually know about our God from His Word? How much do we actually know because we've spent some time reading through it over and over and over again. Every time I read his book, you know what I say? Wow, I, did they put that in there since I read that the last time? I don't remember that. And you know, if you look at it enough times, when we look at it enough times, we, get a, a, we begin to develop a, a deeper, better picture of God's Word. And when we think about this idea of refuge and having the ability to ask God to show graciousness toward us because we have this connection because we understand that God is in control of everything and we all say that and we nod this way and then we act like no. Nah. We act like we're the ones who are in control of things and we're not. Now look with me back at Isaiah 33. He says we've waited for you and here's an interesting phrase and, and I'm reading from the New King James. It says, um, be there, T-H-E-I-R, arm every morning. Now that word there also doesn't appear in Septuagint, just so you'll know. I don't know where that came from, but uh, that's all that I do know. Be there, arm every morning. Our salvation also in time of trouble. Be our salvation in time of trouble trouble. Now blessed is the man who, who takes refuge in God. And tonight as we look at these things together, I want to encourage you to think with me that God has rescuing power. He can rescue us from all of the, the, the trouble that comes our way in this life. Some, some have lives where, where, where financially they have done well and health-wise they may have done well. Some not so much at all. And, and we need to keep all of these things in mind together as we, we go through this life and realize that God is he's still in control. He is still in control. And our salvation in time of trouble... Now here's another thought. It's one else, another thing that I encourage you folks at home. I say, when you wake up, remember to think up and thank up. Now that one is one you can take home because it rhymes. When you wake up, think up and thank up. Think up to the mighty God when you first wake up in the morning. I heard, I heard John Dewberry say one time, if you don't believe that God woke you up this morning, you take your alarm clock to the graveyard and see how well it does. When you wake up, think up and think up. Now, I don't know about you, but as, as was pointed out to me, as my hair is getting a little more gray, when I wake up in the morning, <laughs> sometimes I can wake up and before I have an opportunity to think up or think at all, the first thing that goes through my mind is, that didn't hurt yesterday. Where did that come from? 
Or, or maybe uh, maybe the first thing that comes to my mind is, is, is why are you awake now? The alarm clock's not going off for 10 minutes. Or, or maybe I'm thinking about something else, but training ourselves to wake up and think up and thank up takes intentional effort. Coming to know God, to put ourselves in a place of refuge before Him, to be able to ask Him with full confidence, will, will, will you be there? Would you be our arm of salvation? Will you be there for us? Those things require effort and intentionality. Look with me back at Isaiah 33 and verse 3. And we're going to go on down through verse 6. At the noise of tumult the people flee, and when you lift up yourself the nations shall be scattered, and your plunder shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar as the running to and fro of locusts he shall run upon them. I want to point out right here, we need to be mindful of the fact that everything is God's. Do you know that? Everything belongs to God. God created everything that we know. He created everything we have. So now wait a minute, Jeff, I've worked mighty hard to have all these things I have. Do you know that God created it all? And we, we need to be mindful of that so that we can be joyous in taking this refuge with Him. Now continue with me. Verse 4 or verse 5, the Lord is exalted for He dwells on high. He is number one. He is potentate. He is above all. God always has been, always will. There is no beginning. There is no end. He always will be and He should be number one in our lives. He is number one over the universe whether He's number one in our lives or not. That is the reason why I threw out this challenge about how much do you really know? Someone said, well, I can teach somebody what they need to do to be saved. That's great. And I'm glad that you can. And we need to be able to do that. But we also need to be spending more time digging into God's Word to get to know all that He has revealed to us within His Word so that we can understand these things, so that we can, we can apply what we're learning here. Because we, we read there in verse 5, He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness, Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is His treasure. When we go through our days, if we start the day waking up, thinking up, and thinking up, it will change the way that we do life. It will. It'll change. It will change the way that we do life. Now, we've, we've got another reference here, and I want to point out too, because God needs, He is supreme, and He needs to be supreme in our lives. When we go to the second psalm and we look at verse 12, we see something interesting there as well. And if you would go with me there to Psalm chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 12. Verse 11 says, Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. And then the New King James says this, Kiss the Son lest He be angry. The New American Standard says, Kiss His feet and you perish in the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. But watch this, Blessed are them who put their trust in Him. So why am I picking at this? Why am I picking at this, our, our time that we spend looking into God's Word and thinking about that? I'm sure that there's time during the day when you're driving or whenever you're going here or there that there's time for you to meditate on these things. And, and really at the bottom, the anchor part of this verse that we see is blessed are those who put their trust in Him. And when I think about this word blessed, you know, the first thing I think of is joy. I think of joy. Now, in the New Testament, generally speaking, many of us probably would agree that if we were to say, what New Testament book is a book of joy? We would say maybe Philippians. Would we say Philippians? A lot of people call Philippians a book of joy. Part of it has to do with the fact that Paul mentions rejoicing and being joyful within that book so many times. And so let's, let's, while, we're, while we're thinking on these things, let's go and take a look there and take a look at what we find here in the book of Philippians. 
We're going to go and, and take a look there. I'm going to mark this one right here because <clears throat> there's a couple of things that I wanted to point out. When we say blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and that's what we're looking at there in large part from Psalm 34. And we go to the book of Philippians, which is often referred to as a book of joy. What we see here in Philippians is something fascinating to me. Paul starts this, this book off with some very encouraging things. And he does all throughout. And in verse 3, he says, I thank my God for every remembrance of you. I thank my God for every remembrance of you. And you know, when I come here, there are people that I, I come across that I have known for a long time. And I was thinking about Stan earlier, you know, and Stan... Stan and I, were, we, were, we were kids in Bible class together when we were young ones at, uh, at Hillcrest a long time ago. And, and, and Paul is, is having some fond memories. And that's what he's talking about. I thank my God in every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of my request for you with all joy. There it is. Now, you answer me this, and this, of course, is a rhetorical question. Would you agree with me that Paul was a man who put his trust in the Lord? Did he put his trust in the Lord? It seems to me that he certainly did. And as we, we think on these things together, we see that he's writing here to the Philippians and he says, For make of my request for you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel, from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think of you all, because I have you all in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense of the gospel. What's Paul talking about there? Well, we know that Paul would say that he is a, he is a servant of Jesus Christ, but what Let's think about where Paul's at when he's writing the book of Philippians. Paul's in jail. Now, I'm not talking about jail like you see local on the local news today where you, know, you put them in the orange suits or the striped suits and they, they go inside and they're held in the, they're in the air-conditioned places and that sort of thing. And, and, there's, and I'm not talking about that kind of jail. A jail that Paul was in was more like what we would call um, just a, a wet crawl space. It was a dungeon, if you will, and people were just crowded in this space. They, it didn't matter how many they were putting in there. There was nobody counting and making sure that they didn't put too many in there. They just piled them all in there. Now, I want you to understand and listen to me clearly. I grew up in the country, so I understand what this means. Yeah. there was no running water. You follow me? That's aside from drinking water. No, there was no running water. Can you imagine the filth that he was, was in when he's writing this book? And he says, look, I'm remembering you with all joy. How could he do that? How could you face the trials that come your way in a better way so that you don't just feel like giving up sometimes on life as a whole. Putting your trust in the Lord. You see, that's what the psalmist is talking to us about. Blessed is the man who puts his trust in the Lord. Blessed is that person enriched, joyful. And, and wait a minute. Paul is not in a joyful place. Not at all. He's in a place, uh, uh, in a prison that is just horrible. And I was, I was preaching in Montgomery a, a few months ago, and, and there was a brother there who stopped me and said, you know, Jeff, I've been over to that part of the world, and I've seen those things. And he said, you know, as much as you describe them from what you've read about them, and that's all I've done is read about them and seen pictures, he said, until you were there, you just really can't imagine how horrible that must have been when you can see the confined little space that they were put in. 
And yet Paul writes with a heart that's light. How did he do that? How do we have hearts that are light in this troubled, crazy world? By putting our trust in the one who is still in control of it all. And maybe, maybe the, one of the ways that we can do that is spending more time looking at his book and in his word so that we can understand what it is that we need to know about him, that we can put our trust in him. Hear me when I tell you this. Our God has kept every promise that He has ever made, save the second coming of Jesus Christ. And my friend, it's going to happen. It's coming. We can count on God. That's how we can be blessed, taking refuge in Him. Because we can count on Him. And that's the way that Paul's view was of God at this particular juncture in his life. Look with me back here. He says, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you in the affections of Jesus Christ. He longed for people of like mind. Like mind. When I look across this room and I know that you're tired and, and, and it's, been a, it's a Wednesday and it's hot outside. You know, down here in the south, it can be hot or it can be hot, and it's hot right now. And because it is that way, again, I thank you for taking the time to encourage your brothers and sisters by being here to study from God's Word together and to encourage each other simply by your presence. Simply by your presence, you have encouraged one another. And because of this like-mindedness, now watch this. Paul gets into chapter 2, and there he says, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind was that, Paul? What are you talking about? Down at verse 5, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and becoming in the likeness of men. And we're going to stop right there. How, how do I have the mind of Christ? I need to humble myself to God's will. I need to humble myself to God's will. Now here's something that we laugh about sometimes, but this is very serious. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, I do believe, begins with some of the toughest things that a Christian needs to live with there. Jesus told you and I that we need to pray for our enemies. We need to pray for people who will despitefully use us. You mean that brother that sits over there on the other side? And that sister is... Absolutely. You mean that family member? Absolutely. When I was in, in the professional world and I worked in industry, uh, there was a guy that I really believe he thought it was his charge in life to torture me. I do. My, my crew, I had a, a multi-shift uh, situation going on in, in a variety of plants and my, my people handled inventory in that they received and they unloaded trucks and they moved freight from one place to another and they would get raw materials in in one place and we did transport mostly. It was what we did. And so he was inventory. And in inventory he thought, wow, you know, he was, he was really, and I felt like sometimes he was just out to get me. And you know what I had to do? When I really looked at Matthew 5, beginning at verse 44, 44, and 45, I had to say, Lord, forgive me if I'm asking amiss, but will you give this man what he needs so he will leave me alone? <laughs> but what about when it's a family member? What about when it's a brother or sister in Christ? That's when we have to step up. If we're going to be blessed, 
If we're going to be joyous, then we're going to have to think about our relationships. That one is a, is a tough one for us to deal with. And that's just one of many that we think about as we look at these things together. Now, Paul said, and being found in the appearance of a man, watch what Jesus did. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death on the cross. Therefore, verse 9, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, here's something to think about. I'm asking you to trust God and to do things His way. That's bottom line. What I'm asking you, because as we look at, as we look at our text, as we look at our text, oh, taste and see, do you know what those words actually mean? Those words, now I'm, I went back to Psalm 34, sorry. I hopped over real quick. Taste and see, that sounds odd. What does that mean to us today? Here's what it means. It means try and experience. You just try and experience what the, the Lord is good. You try it and you see it. And when you trust in the Lord, you're going to be blessed. We said, well, that's a, that's, a big, that's a big order there, Jeff. Hmm. Think with me about this. Jesus Christ. God in man, Matthew chapter 1. Jesus Christ left His home in glory. Now today was a beautiful day in a lot of ways. Over there on our side of the city this morning it was cloudy and it was cool. Now we didn't get any rain. <laughs> But it was cloudy there for a while and the, and the wind blew a little bit and oh, it was just, just nice. It was nice outside. And the reason why I say that is sometimes when you are in your favorite place outside and you're just enjoying the day, imagine this with me. The glory of heaven will be so much brighter that will not even begin to touch it. Jesus left the glory of heaven on His place, the Word, the Son of God, at the very right hand of God, left His place to come and be born of a virgin. And that's what we see there as Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, that he came, he was born, and he humbled himself to the will of God. You want to be happy? Do things God's way. But wait a minute, Jeff. I'm sick and you don't, you don't know how sick I am. You want to be happy? Do things God's way. I watched my mother live through leukemia for about four years. And she always had this hope. She set an example before me that, that she had no idea of what it was doing to me because of what I saw in her. She was sick and she would say, well, we found a great doctor. You know why? Why is that, Mom? Because God helped us. Do you know what? We got some new medicine. We're going to give this a try. We need to be thanking God about this new medicine. For those of you who have suffered through watching a loved one deal with a terrible debilitating disease, you can understand what I'm saying when I say we can be joyous as we go through these things when we trust our God to keep His promises. Jesus told us in John chapter 14 that if we believe in God, we can believe in Him, okay? 
so we can trust him. And you know what else he said? He said, I would go, I've gone and prepared a place for you. Now, this is a part that I really love. You look at John chapter 14. Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. I love that. Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you. So there's a place for each and every human being that God has. He wants every human being to come to that glorious, beautiful place called heaven. So we have to exercise our superpower of choice. That's what I like to call it, superpower. Superpower of choice. To follow Him in a like manner that Jesus set before us so that we can be blessed. You see, that place called heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And Jesus tells us, as, as uh, Thomas said, well, what are, and Jesus told him, he said in John chapter 14, I'll show you the way. And, Th and, and Thomas was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you talking about the way? We don't know the way. And then Jesus said, wait a minute, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus, will you show us the way? You know, we get over John chapter 3 and verse 16. A lot of the times folks will stop at, at verse 16 because there we know that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And many throughout the world in which we know want to stop right there. I've got one for you. Fasten your seat belts. The demons are believers. They are. You look at James. James chapter 2 and verse 19. He makes it plain. <laughs> the demons believe and tremble. Is that all we need to do? Jesus wouldn't leave us hanging. No, that's not it. No, if we're, when we're involved in sinful things and things that are going to draw us away from God and things that are self-destructive and th things that are going to keep us away, Jesus said that we need to repent. And what is sin? Well, if you want a list, look at Galatians chapter 5 beginning at verse 19. We're all on that list somewhere. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, and we read down through those things. We see some really ugly things. Whatever we find in that list, and we, we often know those things, and we, we need to put them out of our lives. Jesus made it clear to us as well that we need to confess that we believe that He is the Son of God. We read that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. We see an example of that in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37, as we get down through those things, 38, right, on, right along there. The Ethiopian eunuch. But Jesus also tells us that we need to be baptized. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, should be well known to everyone in this room. I would hope that it is. We, we see that the he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. There's an equality conjunction there. And equal, you know, it makes it equal. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you don't believe, you're not going to be condemned anyway because you're not going to do anything. So as we think on these things tonight, I would venture to say that probably just about everybody within my hearing has probably been obedient to the gospel that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we find there in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in order to do these things, and that's doing truth, and that's what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 3 when he comes down to verse 21. In doing truth and doing these things, we do these things to be obedient to the Master. Now once we have done that, again going back to James as well as Revelation, we need to be living faithful lives. We need to be living faithful lives. Living faithful lives means that I'm submitting myself to the will of God so that I can be blessed in this life no matter what I face, no matter what kind of traffic comes my way, no matter what kind of bills that come my way, no matter what kind of aches and pains come my way, no matter what kind of crazy things come in this, in this, this economic market that we live in, no matter what comes our way, 
I can take refuge in the one who loves me so. Jesus loves us so much that he kept the will of the Father and he was willing to die on that cross at Calvary. Jesus loves us so much that he pointed us the way to heaven. And as we, we think on these things tonight and we look back at Philippians chapter 2, I think about what we find over here in verse three, in chapter 3 and verse 12. And this is Paul writing. And he says, not that I have already attained or that am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Doesn't matter where we are on the timeline. We need to be reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So where are you? Are you truly, are you truly someone who is, is blessed because looking back at our text, because you trust the Lord, can you imagine the trust that Jesus had when he left his place of glory, came to this earth, followed the Father's plan and is returned to the right hand of the Father and has invited you to join him in that place of glory. Tonight, I can't help but ask this question. Are you the one of whom the psalmist speaks being blessed because you trust in the Lord? If you find yourself, my friend, distanced from our God, whether it's having never obeyed the gospel that can be done this evening. And if you find yourself in need of prayer because of the, the burdens of this life have drawn you away, and maybe there's been too much time spent in knowing other things than coming to know our God, tonight is the night to put your complete trust in Him. Don't hesitate. Not at all. Be His now as together we stand and sing.